Hello, I'm Brian Mounts. I run TurfMechanic.com and this channel. Today I want to talk to you about tall fescue. More precisely, I want to talk about caring for tall fescue. If you've got tall fescue out in the lawn, then there are some special things that you need to be aware of to have the healthiest lawn possible. For the most part, this video is going to be about turf type tall fescue. However, most of what I say will apply to Kentucky 31 tall fescue if you do have that in the yard. The only main difference that you've got to keep in mind is Kentucky 31 tends to grow a little bit faster than turf type tall fescue, so you might need to mow a little bit more frequently. If you'd like to learn a little bit more detail about the difference between turf type tall fescue and Kentucky 31, I do have a video that I posted not that long ago linked right up here. You can also find it in the description. Now, with that being said, let's get to the maintenance plan. For those of you who just like the meat and potatoes, I'm going to break this video into two completely different parts. The first part is going to be very short. It's a summary of what you need to know. Then the second part is going to be much more expanded information that will go into greater depth on each point, each concept. If you've got turf type tall fescue in your lawn, this is turf type tall fescue. Behind me, in my lawn, I've got Kentucky bluegrass and ryegrass mixed together. Uh, for fescue, I'm starting to grow it up on my hill, but I'm also growing it in pots for experimentation and example purposes. If you have turf type tall fescue in your lawn, you need to cut it tall. That's it. Don't ever think about cutting it short. Just keep it tall. Keep it over four inches, four and a half inches. If your lawnmower goes up to five, cut it there. It will perform better over the course of the entire year if you always keep your turf type tall fescue tall. This is especially important in the summer. In the summer, most people growing turf type tall fescue are in the transition zone and in the Midwest where summers can still get pretty hot. If you're growing turf type tall fescue in your lawn and it's super duper hot and super duper dry, it is going to experience heat stress and drought stress. The longer you keep it, the less frequently you have to mow it. And when you mow it less frequently and you keep it longer, then the plant itself is retaining more water in the leaf blade and it remains healthier for a longer period of time. Generally speaking, you're not going to fertilize turf type tall fescue in the summer. You don't want to push leaf growth. If you're pushing leaf growth, then that means you've got to cut the grass more frequently and that's what we don't want. You will fertilize in the spring and the fall and in the fall your grass will do better if you overseed and if you core aerate. Turf type tall fescue has extremely deep root systems and if you can core aer aerate in the fall then you are able to deliver more nutrients and water and air down into the root system so that those roots can thoroughly dig deep into the ground in preparation for winter. In the early spring, you should put a grassy weed pre-emergent down. This will control crabgrass and other grassy weeds. You do that before it gets warm. Honestly, lots of people haven't even mowed their grass yet and they're already putting down the spring pre-emergent. In the middle of the summer, although you're not fertilizing, you will benefit by putting down humic acid, hydrotain, and potassium into the lawn. All three of those things are going to help the grass resist stresses like excessive heat and low water. The potassium helps essentially boost the grass's immune system. That's how I describe it. That's how I think about it. I'm sure a scientist would think of it differently. I've got a video up here that I posted about potassium and what it does for your lawn. It's also linked down in the description below if you want to learn more. Generally speaking, if you can put these three products down, keep your grass cut very high and infrequently through the summer, it should retain its color and resist thinning more than your neighbor's lawn. Last points to throw out there, during these moments of high heat and drought, if you're experiencing it, your grass, even at a high setting, will be stressed out. So if you're planning on throwing a backyard birthday party in the month of August, consider the damage that it's going to do to your grass. I'm not saying don't go on the lawn, but just know that under stress, 
once you start trampling all over it, that's when damage occurs, long lasting damage. It's gonna force your hand into doing a um, more substantial overseeding project in the fall. Now, overseeding in the fall doesn't have to be done every year, but it probably should be done every year. Each lawn is going to be different in the extent of overseeding that it needs to be done. I tend to believe that if you cut the grass slightly shorter in the fall, then run your core aerator over it, then you can go ahead and overseed. At that point, you've got a low turf, you've got exposed soil, and the overseeding will take better. Down in the description below, I've got a link to more information on overseeding and getting it done quickly, efficiently, and for the least cost possible, because who wants to spend more than you have to? Now, that was still long for the meat and potatoes, but that's basically it. If you're dealing with turf type tall fescue, your grass wants to be tall and your grass wants to be in full sun. But even though it's in full sun in the middle of the summer in the transition zone, it can get quite hot. So there are some special details that make your grass a little bit healthier, a little bit more able to withstand all things that are thrown at it. Here I've got turf type tall fescue. As I said before, this is two months old. Most of this, most of this grass hasn't fully matured yet. Although there are some grass blades that are really starting, starting to widen up. Now, tall fescue is known for its wide, uh, abrasive blades, uh, blades of grass. This is an example here on the side. This blade is starting to get pretty wide and substantial. They are serrated on the side. They will dull your lawnmower blade if you're cutting uh, grass frequently with them. That's not a bad thing, it's just a matter of fact. When you are dealing with turf type tall fescue, you're going to have to sharpen your lawnmower blades a little bit more frequently than other grass types. And that's not just because you want the lawnmower to get through the grass easier, it's also for the health of your grass. A lawnmower blade has to spin around fast and cut the blade, but when the blades are thicker and more abrasive and harder to cut, then the blades start ripping. And when the blades rip instead of cut, then that opens the door to disease and fungal attacks. It's not gonna happen every time, but there are a couple main types of fungal diseases that happen to tall fescue, usually in the late summer going into early fall. Both of these types of attacks can be mitigated by putting down a fungal pre-emergent, I don't know if that's really the right way to call it, but a, uh, a fungicide, that's, that's what I'm talking about here, um, in advance of the problem. You can do a preventative fungi fungicide application in early, early August when you're not fertilizing. You put that down before the fungal attacks begin. That is going to be much better for your lawn than waiting for a potential attack to happen and then trying to fix the problem later. It's also a very good habit to pull those lawnmower blades off from time to time and, and sharpen them because that will also help prevent fungal infestations from happening later in the season. Hydrotain is a product that most people in America don't know about um, and don't buy. Uh, it's a specialty product. Um, I've got a link to it down in the description below. It's not necessary, but it certainly does help get through the hottest, driest of the summer months. Uh, it is a product that literally, it literally makes your grass thrive on less water. Let's put it like that. When it's hot, water evaporates. When it's dry, it's hard to get a lot of water on your lawn to begin with. So if you put this product on the lawn, it will retain water, it's hydrotain. It will retain the water for a longer period of time, which means your grass will go more days before it starts experiencing drought stress. That can be pretty important when it comes to your watering schedule. If you can minimize the amount of water you put on the lawn, you're gonna save some money and your grass is gonna be a little bit healthier. Now, I also recommend putting down a liquid aeration product. Now, I've got a I got an example of this. This is the product that I use. Um, this is uh, Chemwise Simple Plant Food um, Liquid Aeration. Now there are other brands out there. 
that make similar products. But the reason why I like this one the best um, is because this has a particularly high potassium um, percentage. 8% uh, of this bottle is potassium. Potassium goes into the grass and it essentially makes the grass have a better immune system. It's able to fend off uh, stresses like heat and drought and trampling uh, better when the immune system is better. Forgive me if that's a bad analogy, but that's how I look at it. Potassium is the immune system booster for grass. This has that in it. What I also like about the liquid aeration products is that they all contain humic acid. Humic acid allows for better nutrient uptake and it allows for better water retention in these plants. Both of those are double whammies for helping your grass thrive. Just be healthier. Liquid aeration I like to put down in the middle of the summer, maybe at the end of June and then the very beginning of August. Uh, you can put the one down at the, end, at the beginning of August around the same time you're putting your fungicide treatment down. These are, of course, obviously liquid products. Now, not everybody out there wants to go out and buy fancy uh, equipment to spray these things. You really don't need fancy equipment. Now, I use um, some battery sprayers, but literally, these things right here, these are just, I mean, you just screw them right onto the top and connect it to a hose. These things you can buy for like 10 bucks, 15 bucks, I don't know, it depends on where you're buying it what brand made it but it's literally it's just a nozzle that goes right onto a tub um, they cost very little and i mean you'll lose them in the garage they're so small so it's worth picking up one of those if you don't want to spend the money on something bigger liquid aeration product i definitely believe in in the early spring if you can put down your grassy weed preventer there's many brands that make grassy weed crab grass preventers definitely put it down before anyone else in your neighborhood that's just that's just the best way to say it right there before people are mowing the grass before anybody's doing any, any anything to their lawn put down your grassy weed preventer it doesn't have to be a liquid uh, there's granule products out there you can probably buy these things in january and february just from your local big box store again granular fertilizer spreaders um, don't have to cost a lot you certainly can spend hundreds of dollars on these things but you can also get those little handheld twirly things I, mean, I don't own one of those but those things cost about 10 to 15 bucks you can get like the really um, inexpensive uh, sit on the ground and push it um, options those little push behind spreaders don't cost very much they certainly cost more than the handheld ones but you can still probably find one just locally at a big box store for under 50 bucks probably i'll throw a link to uh down below in the description to the one that i have out in the garage it's one of the scotch scott's edge guard options i do prefer the ones with an edge guard because we all have edges to our properties whether it's here i've got like a small retaining wall or it's the neighbor's lawn or it's the sidewalk or whatever it is the ones with the edge guards are worth spending a little bit of money on. When it comes to watering tall fescue grass, it's really no different from other kinds of grass. Watering is important the time of day that you do it. Early morning, like as the sun is coming up, so if you've got a sprinkler timer, then that's great because you can get it going probably before you even get out of bed. But if you can water your lawn very, very first thing in the morning, that is optimal. Later in the morning is good enough Worst case scenario, do it in the evening and hope for the best. Um, it's gonna be better than not watering it, but if you can water very, very early in the morning, as the sun's coming up, then you are going to be able to thoroughly saturate the ground under the grass. Now, it's not like we don't care if the grass is wet. I mean, I have a garden back here. We put soaker hoses under the plants. The point is we want the ground to be wet, not the grass. When you get the grass wet, that's when, that's when the grass becomes susceptible to disease. Um, but we don't have the option of just sprinkling the ground. That's why we water first thing in the morning. And I am an enormous advocate for watering one time a week. Now, lots of people out there will say three or four times a week, spread your water out through the week. I just don't agree. I don't agree. 
if you can water for like if you got a sprinkler zone if you can turn that zone on for four hours straight one time a week I believe that that is better than sprinkling for an hour and a half three times a week. Now, if you're doing an hour and a half three times a week, then that is what? One, three, four and a half hours of water compared to one four-hour session. I believe the four-hour session is better. And that's because as you sprinkle, the water goes on the grass and that grass has to get thoroughly wet. Because remember, tall fescue is tall. You've probably got five-inch grass out there half of the time. It takes a lot of water to get the grass blades wet enough for the water to start going down to the soil itself. Once it gets to the soil itself, then the actual soil starts getting wet. And that's what we want because the root zone is down here. If you can water for an excessive amount of time, if your neighbors are just looking at you like they've had the water on for a long time, then you're probably doing pretty good. You could get a little cup and stick it out into the lawn to measure how much water is coming down every hour. I recommend that you do that. But the fact of the matter is almost every sprinkler system out there takes a lot longer to put a substantial amount of water on the lawn than most people realize. When I put a cup out there and I run my sprinkler for three hours, then only one inch goes on the ground. That's it, just an inch in three hours. So I do about four hours to get over an inch, and that helps me get through the summer. Where I live, we don't get excessively hot, but we do have a good solid month, month and a half, where we're in the low 90s. And I can get through the summer just fine watering one time a week, so long as that one time that I water is very, very deep. An advantage to doing this in this way is that you can run a single zone like for instance here I have three zones for my grass now other places I know have like 10 12 zones there's some crazy systems out there but you don't have to run all of your zones every day you can just pick and choose one two or three zones out of all of yours and run each one of those and spread them out through the week so zone one might be on Monday zone two might be on Tuesday zone three on Thursday and that way you know every day a sprinkler is running somewhere on your property on one zone now i don't like stepping out to deal with the dogs first thing in the morning and having to navigate around sprinklers it kind of helps because most days six days out of the week my grass blades are completely dry and it's easy for me to walk on them but if i pull a core sample then the soil is wet all week long especially if you pull that core during the hottest parts of the summer, if you go through a heat wave, turf type tall fescue, although it is a cold season grass that can go into the transition zone and hold up to, to high heat, it still doesn't want excessive heat for an excessive amount of time. So let's say you are in Oklahoma um, or Missouri and you are hitting 100 plus for a couple weeks straight some random heat wave hits you and it's just hard on the grass this grass is going to want to check out it just is but during the hottest part of the day if you want to take the edge off and extend extend the life of your grass extend the vibrance of your grass into those and maybe through those excessive heat situations give it a spritz in the afternoon around the hottest part of the day so even if the, the grass is getting ample water, the high heat is going to still stress it out to the point where it wants to check out. It wants to go into hibernation mode. Um, it will lose some of its color. It will lose some of its bounciness. It will feel more crisp and brittle. Um, it's the heat that does that. And when that happens, all you've got to do to keep it going a little bit longer just to get through that heat spell is to give it a spritz. You're not watering it to water the soil. You're, this is the only time of the year that you're actually watering the grass blades. So on those days, let's say it's 102 degrees outside and it's 4.30 in the afternoon, you can go and spray your grass down for like five minutes and it will literally cool the blade off. Just like if you were to splash cold water into a bowl of hot soup the hot soup would cool down quickly 
the grass blades will cool down quickly because even these tall fescue blades that are thick and robust, they're still pretty skinny and it doesn't take very much water to physically cool them off. Um, if you can cool them off, then that's going to take some of the stress off of the blade and it will stay green and stay vibrant a little bit longer, hopefully long enough to get you out of the heat spell. Ideally during the summer, you won't be cutting the grass hardly at all. You don't want the grass growing. Tall fescue, you want it to remain tall and long and you want it to grow as slow as possible. When you have to cut it, those times that you have to cut it, do not cut more than a third of that grass blade off. If your grass is six and a half inches tall, cut maybe two inches off, but no more than that. You don't want to cut too much off. You want to take the edge off so that it's not flopping over and matting down, but you don't want to cut too much off that it loses its moisture and loses its vibrance. If you cut too much off the grass at any point of the year, it's hard on the grass, but especially in the summer. In the fall, core air core aeration comes into play. Now this is a task not for the average person. Probably most people in your neighborhood don't core aerate, although many grass types do benefit from it. Turf type tall fescue, and Kentucky 31 for that matter, do benefit greatly because their root systems are so deep. Now some grass types have somewhat shallow root systems, so if you water heavy that upper layer of soil is where the roots reside and they do they do fine but with turf type tall fescue and all kinds of tall fescue their roots can extend well beyond six inches and that means a deep water might water the top layer of soil but everything down super deep is still a little dry it's really hard to get water eight inches down into the ground to combat that in the fall you core aerate. You can take a core aerator, core aerator that you rent from your local tool rental. You can go buy one. You could manually do it, although that takes an awful long time uh, and it's a lot of effort, but you can manually do it with, uh, with one of the ones that you push into the ground with your foot. The point is those open up ideally three, four, five inch cores, tubes that go straight into the ground. When you water, the water goes into those tubes and it immediately goes four inches into the soil. Like it just goes straight down. It doesn't have to saturate the upper layers of soil. It will go all the way down. It will, it will, air will be able to travel down there. If you fertilize, the fertilizer can go down there. Essentially, you're opening up passageways deep into the ground so that you can get water, air, and nutrients to the lower reaches of your fescue's root structure. Your, I don't want to call it a root ball. They don't really have a root ball, but the root structure from all these plants are so far down that the core aeration allows things to get down there that otherwise wouldn't make it there. This is especially important in the fall because all of the energy from the grass is going to transfer into the root system as it prepares for winter. Now, summer, it wants to go dormant, but we can keep it going. During the winter, we can't keep it going. It will go dormant. All of the energy from the grass will transfer to the root system. So we are going to piggyback on that, that function of the grass that it actually wants to do. We're gonna piggyback on it and supercharge it. We pull cores and then we fertilize and we water deep, we are going to substantially increase the health of the root systems of this grass. Therefore, as it goes into winter and it goes into hibernation, so to speak, come spring, you've got a substantial amount of healthy energy in that root system that will then transfer back into the grass blade. Once that energy comes back into the grass blade, your grass, your tall fescue is going to be vibrant, taller, greener, and more healthy earlier than just about anyone in your neighborhood. Lastly, let's talk about fertilization. You put your spring pre-emergent down before everything wakes up. Let's call it March. Most of the time, tall fescue grass has grown up north. Now, it might be warm in March down in Alabama, but this grass is probably not grown down in Alabama. Where this grass is grown, it starts warming up in March. So if you're putting 
pre-emerge it down then, then you start your fertilization schedule. You're gonna be fertilizing this with, I prefer a slow release granular or a slow release liquid fertilizer. And I like to do light applications multiple times. Now, your mileage may vary. You might prefer other things, but if you put down light applications regularly, that minimizes the risk of fertilizer burn, of damage, and it eliminates the risk of the grass grows a lot and then it grows slow and then it grows a lot and then it grows slow. I don't like that. I want it to be even. I have some products that I use. I have been using a lot of these ChemWise Simple Plant Food products and I do like them so far. Um, I'll leave a link to those down in the description below with maybe a couple alternatives um, based on pricing. But um, I do like I mean, honestly, you could probably use something just that you find at your local store also. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, fertilize, the point here is you need to fertilize in the spring and the fall, but take the summer off. The summer, put down those specialty products. They aren't exactly fertilizers. They will help your plant get through the summer, but they won't make the plant grow. It's not like actual fertilizing. Stop fertilizing probably by mid-June, maybe late June if your temperatures are still lower take the summer off you don't want to push growth during the summer and then towards the end of august going into september as temperatures start dropping that's when you can bust out the fertilizer again and do your fall push get that plant get those plants healthy strong vibrant so that when it comes time to quarter aerate and push root growth you're able to do that from a from a uh, healthy standpoint from a healthy starting point the last thing that I want to say has to do with cutting towards the end of the year. Now, most grass types should be cut a little bit lower than they normally are going into winter. So I would say the last cut or two of the season start bringing the, the level down. But this is still tall fescue. It still wants to be tall. Now, the reason you cut it slightly shorter is because over the winter, it all goes dormant and all flops down. And that's when snow mold and other kinds of problems can arise. The longer the grass blades are, as they're just like packed on the ground under mounds of snow and mud, the longer those grass blades are, the worse it is for coming out of winter dormancy. Um, cut it back a little bit. Don't go crazy. Maybe three and a half inches to four inches. Certainly don't leave it at four and a half to five inches. Uh, there's no reason to scalp it down to two. Uh, that would be detrimental to the cause of your turf. Uh, but bring it back just a little bit right before the winter freeze. The way that I film videos is I know my topic and I ramble and I try to ramble in the most helpful way possible. I mean, I got notes here to kind of keep me going, but I also operate a website, turfmechanic.com. Down in the description below is a link to a page that is this exact topic in text format. All the links are there, all the information is there, and it's I don't know, it's written in a way that makes sense. If you have tall fescue and you want it to be healthy, you want it to be as good as it can be, go down there into the description, hit that link, go over to the website. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Please hit the like button if this was helpful and please subscribe for more videos and tutorials kind of like this. Probably not as long though.